Well, let's get started, everybody. Thanks so much for being here today on a uh, extremely busy week in the Capitol. Uh, we try and put these on when the Capitol is busy, but not necessarily when the assembly is in session at the moment. So uh, here we are. Um, we're glad to have a full room uh, with lots of representation from different sectors and as well as legislative staff uh, to hear about trends and policies that help build Wisconsin's healthcare workforce in our state. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly introduce the Evidence-Based Health Policy Project. I'm Sam Austin, the project director. Uh, the goal of our project is to connect research and expertise of the university and elsewhere into private and public sector policymaking with a focus here on the state legislature. Uh, we support an evidence-informed approach to uh, decision-making through public briefings like this, regional roundtables, and trainings for legislators and staff on resources for building evidence into their work. This project is driven by the idea that interaction between policymakers and academic researchers can enhance and elevate the work of both. This project is a partnership of the UW-Madison Population Health Institute at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, the Falls School of Public Affairs at UW-Madison, as well as the Wisconsin Legislative Council, the nonpartisan attorney staff for the legislature, which recognize Hillary Shager from the Fallout School, as well as Steve McCarthy, who are our project partners, uh, and play a key role in making this project successful. Uh, the EBHPP is made possible by the support of our funders at the Wisconsin Partnership Program at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, as well as the UW-Madison Chancellor's Office. We thank them for their support. Um, Hope you're able to join us a couple minutes early uh, for the poster session up front that's featured students from the UW School of Medicine and Public Health's um, Triumph program that's training in urban medicine and public health, as well as the Wisconsin Academy for Rural Medicine at the Med School, as well as students from the uh, School of Nursing. Um, I'd like to thank them. They're lined up in the conspicuous white coats behind me, um, not blending in all that well. Uh, we thank DeMarco Bowen, Gabby Wachwick. Max Rusick and Britt McAdams, uh, they're in the Triumph program, uh, and, as well as Aaron McGlynn from the WARM program, and Natalie Kustner from the School of Nursing. Anybody? Uh, um, hope you're able to touch base with them, hear about some of their research and uh, their current training to become the next generation of providers. And their training is so current, in fact, that I think some of them have to scoot off to class in about a half an hour, so hope you had a chance to talk to them. Um, Obviously, part of the equation that gets us to healthy communities in Wisconsin uh, is good public policy. And the front lines of uh, building that policy framework is the day-to-day -day work of the committees in the legislature. So for that reason, I'm really uh, pleased to welcome Senator Dan Fine, who's the vice chair of the Senate Workforce Committee, for some opening remarks uh, before we get started with our panel. Uh, Senator Fine represents the 18th Senate District, which covers parts of Winnebago, Fond du Lac, and Dodge counties. Prior to being elected to the Senate in 2016, Senator Fian had a 29-year career in printing in Fond du Lac. Uh, in addition to his role in the Workforce Committee, he sits on the University and Technical Colleges Committee, Committee on Economic Development, and uh, also serves on the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporations Board. And it's my understanding there's two uh, children, current UW-Madison students in uh, risk management and teaching. Is that correct? All right, great. Uh, well, thank you, Senator, for joining us today and look forward to your comments. Good afternoon. My name is Senator Dan Fine. It's good to be here with you today, representing my colleagues in the legislature, as well as as vice chair of the Senate Committee on Workforce Development, Military Affairs, and Senior Issues. Our committee has tackled a number of important initiatives this legislative in session, this legislative session, including improving access to apprenticeships for high schools and technical college students. We're also in the process of taking on um, a lot more coming up in the future. We're looking at doing a legislative study committee. We've asked for that. Um, there's been a number of people asking for legislative study committees dealing with workforce. Um, in addition to the study committee, my office will continue to work to identify ways the legislature can help develop workforce and build off our current economic successes. Um, one of the hospitals up in my area, Agnesian Healthcare, St. Angus Hospital, they utilize the youth, youth apprenticeship program to get kids from the local high school interested. The beauty of that is when you bring in a child at that age, they find out real quick if they like it or they don't. And before you go spend a lot of money on a college education and realize you don't, let's find out sooner. So that's a great part of getting kids involved at a young age, getting them in the work environment. And I think that can help with whether it's urban or, or, or rural, it doesn't matter. We need to get kids more involved at an earlier age to decide if it's something they want to do. 
as one of our largest and fastest growing parts of our economy, healthcare workforce from CNAs, nurses, nursing aides, to doctors is crucial to our quality of life and our continued economic success here in Wisconsin. Hey, Wisconsin delivers a great, we have a great healthcare system, but we need to make sure that we have the workforce coming in to maintain that. Um, right now we're finding with all sectors, whether it be healthcare, agriculture, manufacturing, we just don't have enough people. So we need more people in this state. We gotta figure out how to get that here. And that ties into the workforce issue ties in education and economic development. And I serve on those three committees and I'm proud to do that. And hopefully we're working towards a solution that next year we can have some serious workforce development reform and bring more people to our state. I look forward to the information presented today and the continued conversation on how we can best move Wisconsin forward. I plan to stick around for a while. I do have other things I need to get to, so I will be ducking out before this is over. So. But I do welcome your input, and Greg from my office will be staying for the entire event, so he will get me keep me up to date on what all happened after I leave. So thank you, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Well, thank you very much, Senator, on making some time on a, on a busy day here. A couple nuts and bolts things before we begin. On your way in, you should have picked up a folder uh, inside where there's an agenda for the day, uh, bios of all our speakers, a uh, list of further resources to dive a little deeper into this topic, uh, and several handouts from the organizations who are represented uh, at the panel today. You also see a two-sided evaluation sheet that we hope you'll take a minute uh, at some point before three o'clock to fill out. You can drop that on the table on your way out the door. Uh, we try to be as responsive as possible and can't do that without your feedback. Uh, so we've got a full day, so let's get right to it. Um, so I'll briefly introduce the speakers as we go, but uh, for full bios, again, check those folders. Um, we'll start our panel off with a national view on research and emerging workforce uh, issues from uh, Polly Pittman, who's the co-director of the George Washington University Health Workforce Institute, as well as the federally funded GW Health Workforce Research Center. Dr. Pittman, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? You can hear us. You just want to X out that little window there. I just did that. All right. And, and I, think we're, uh, I think we're rolling, so take it away. Excellent. Well, I wish I could see you all. Um, I'm glad you can see me, and I am certainly honored and um, very pleased to be with you this afternoon to uh, share with you a few remarks about the work that we've been doing, um, trying to understand the changing configuration and distribution of the healthcare workforce in the U.S. Um, I have to say, having reviewed some of the organizational websites that are um, present on the panel today, I am incredibly impressed with the work you all are doing in terms of really using policy to um, uh, make sure that you have the workforce that you need in the right places. It's, um, it's an area where I think states lead. Um, the federal government has some participation, obviously at the level of funding, uh, particularly residency trainings for physicians, but a lot of the um, innovative thinking about new models of care and how they relate to outcomes, as well as the, the thinking about um, pipelines and, and, and incentivizing, incentivizing the workforce to um, be in the places where we need them is happening at the state level. So um, hats off to you all for the terrific work that you're doing. And, and again, it's an honor to share with you a few findings from the work that we've been doing at a national level. So I wanted to um, briefly run through four uh, topics. Um, I wanted to look at what we're seeing at a national level in terms of changes, primarily in terms of the hospital level and the community health center level as sort of a proxy for primary care. Uh, we have done less work in some of the other areas of care, such as long-term and behavioral health, oral health, uh, and um, community-based health. There are other centers that are working on some of these issues, and I'd be happy to to make sure that those relationships are established um, if there's particular interest in, in any of those areas. Um, so just descriptively, I wanted to, to talk to you about what has changed in the last decade or so in those two spheres. Um, then to share with you some of the findings we have from the studies that have looked at the relationship of new health policies, in particular payment reforms to these configurations. In other words, to, to what extent can we explain these changes um, as a result of different policies. And then um, really the holy grail is, you know, does this matter? Does this actually affect health, health outcomes? Um, and eventually does this affect costs? Um, and that has been an area where, frankly, the field of health 
uh, workforce research is just getting started. Um, it's methodologically quite complex to establish relationships of causality in this messy healthcare system that we have. Um, but we're working hard in that area, and I, and I have a few preliminary findings um, I'm excited to share with you. And then lastly, I thought I would close with just some questions that I think emerge from some of our findings that may um, be an interesting point of conversation with you all. And um, again, most of what I'm presenting is a result of the work we've done uh, under the HRSA funded, funded Health Workforce Research Center. I've put a little asterisk next to um, findings or titles of findings that were funded by others. Um, and I, I have included a few of those to sprinkle in because I think it helps uh, tell the story. So. Um, Starting off uh, with the community health centers, we have um, longitudinal data and are able to see from 07 to 13 are, are the first studies and actually we've been able to, to continue to document these trends up to 2015 data using the uniform data uh, set, which many of you know if you've uh, had a relationship with CHCs they're required to report to the federal government on, among other things, the health workforce as well as some of the quality outcomes. And it's it's not perfect data, but it's it's uh, better than what we have uh, in most other data sources. So the big story is that um, if you were to look at the staff to patient ratios, um, we we are seeing a pretty large growth in the um, CHC workforce overall in the nation. It's about a 10% workforce growth. Um, when, when essentially holding steady the number of visits. Um, in particular, we saw mental health and dental health up. Obviously, there's been a strong federal policy and probably state policy as well to try to co-locate behavioral health and, dent and oral health um, in primary care, and we're seeing that in the data. Um, interestingly, we did not see as fast a pace of growth among substance abuse health workforce, and that's a kind of wonky thing that um, we're not sure how to explain given the importance of substance abuse these days. Um, it may be that some of that substance abuse um, staff is actually buried in the behavioral health staff, so it may be a data issue, but it is something to watch. I think that perhaps increasingly social workers are doing some of the substance abuse uh, services. Um, and um, so at the level of the medical staff, so that, that's within a category in the data that we call other, other health staff. Um, within medical staff, which is basically the primary care providers, the nurses, and medical assistants, um, we have seen um, quite an increase, um, but not all of the different professions have increased to the same degree, and that's where we begin to get some clues about how the model of care may be changing. We don't know why it's changing yet, we just know that it's changing. Um, so the big story there is that the percent of uh, physicians within the medical staff has been um, not growing as fast as the other areas. So in other words, their section of the pie is shrinking uh, over time. So um, that is um, essentially about a 34% growth for physicians over this period, but if you compare that to NPs and PAs to nurse practitioners and physician assistants, we see a 74% growth a 43% growth for nurses and a 60% growth for NAs. So you can see that the, the primary care um, MDs and DOs are a smaller proportion of the, of the pie. Um, in terms of the different sectors, um, uh, it's interesting that administrative has only uh, grown about 3.6, which I think is good news. So we're really seeing more, more clinicians. Um, the medical is 12%, other health, which is allied, is 30%, and enabling is 6.9. So enabling would be things like uh, community health workers. So we're seeing a real growth of co-location of services and increasing uh, employment of allied health professionals in community health centers. Um, so all of that seems to be pretty good news. I wanted to throw a few things out that is um, perhaps not um, as good. Um, we see, for example, in uh, the national um, Center for Health, uh, the National Association for Community Health Centers um, did a survey last year on vacancies and the results were uh, quite alarming. There's a 60% vacancy for, 60% of CHCs have a vacancy for physicians, 50% for MPs and 18% for PAs. So clearly um, the decline in the proportion of physicians on staff is not 
uh, entirely by choice, if at all by choice. There seems to be a difficulty recruiting, so that's probably no news to you all, but it's interesting for us to see in the data. Um, but similarly, uh, there seems to be a real demand for MPs that is not being met, and somewhat less so for PAs. Um, we, um, another, another study that we did not do that was um, conducted by Friedberg and colleagues um, showed in the um, community health center world that there is a decline in satisfaction among uh, clinicians. And um, that is obviously concerning because we know that is very related to retention. So both of those things are somewhat concerning. Um, we've also seen um, in terms of overall, not just CHCs, that Americans report that they um, at a higher level have no um, usual source of care. So this is somewhat surprising given the expansion of coverage in our country and the emphasis on um, moving from sort of a hospital-centric model of care to a primary and community-based uh, model of care. And um, I think there's a lot of digging that needs to happen here to, to better understand what's happening, why are people still reporting that they have no usual source of care, and why is it actually getting worse. And similarly, we see a real problem in terms of referrals to specialists. So for example, at the level of the CHCs, only 30% 30% of kids that are seen at CHCs are um, not having a complete referral to the specialist, which suggests that they are um, experiencing shortages of specialists and, and difficulties in access there. So even though we have staffed up, so to speak, in the world of primary care, um, the challenges are, are pretty serious still. And I imagine in Wisconsin that that's particularly so. Um, shifting now to hospitals, um, the data is a, a different set, um, but it's, it's uh, the American Hospital Association from 2010 to 14. We've also used some premier data, which is in associations of hospitals, to try to dig deeper into different kinds of jobs that are not disaggregated in the HA data. Um, so among hospitals, we're seeing a rise in the number of hospitals that are using NPs and PAs. This is a real trend. Um, similar to the CHC, so we're at, at we're at about 63% of hospitals are using MPs and PAs in all kinds of different ways that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, interestingly, there is a pretty steady RN to patient ratio when you control for patient acuity, so um, that seems to be good news. There, there's an, um, you know, a lot of concern about nurse staffing, obviously, because it's been shown to be related to patient outcomes and, and mortality. Um, there is a slight decline in the assistive personnel that supports these nurses, however, over the course of these years. It's not a huge decline, but it's small. And when we dig into which jobs are actually declining, it's really interesting because here we see what um, I've tried to describe as de-skilling. We're seeing a drop in the number of high and middle skilled workers as compared to the lower skilled workers. Um, so whereas the, the first two groups are um, declining quite rapidly, the lowest group, the lowest group of workers, uh, least level of education and lowest level of wages is actually increasing. So um, one can think about the implications of that from the point of view of the nurse workload and potential for burnout. We don't know for sure, but, it's, but it is um, somewhat of a red flag. So I'm um, turning now to what we know about uh, which policies are driving these uh, changes. It may be that other things are driving these changes that are not policies. So we try to control for everything um, that is not related to the policy, like uh, local density and supply of different health professions, um, even the, um, the economic situation of particular provider organizations to better understand how we can isolate the effect of particular policies and particular um, payment policies. Um, so in the case of PCMH, um, there is, when we control for everything, the effect of PCMH, in this case we're using the CHC as our universe of uh, providers, um, is primarily to drive the hiring of NPs and PAs. So we see a marked decline um, in the relative role of physicians, particularly in PCMHs. And again, we don't know why, we just know that there's a statistically significant association when we control for everything else. Um, based on some qualitative work that we've done, my suspicion is that it has to do with the notion of teamwork. Um, PCMH is very, um, emphasizes teamwork, and it may be that providers or provider organizations are seeing that they 
really need to build up their um, advanced practice staff and that there may be some efficiencies there. So we don't know why this is happening. We just know that there, there is a relationship between adoption of PCMH and um, an increase in the number of uh, advanced practice staff. The electronic health record adoption is a really interesting area. And here we've looked at productivity in particular. Um, so we see at the level of staffing in CHCs and primary care that adoption of electronic health records is associated with a more hiring of nurses and of medical assistants. Um, so that's interesting in and of itself. And then um, the other thing that we see is that productivity tends to drop um, for about the first three years and then it begins to increase the productivity, productivity overall of the CHC as measured in terms of number of patient visits controlling for acuity. The data on accountable care organizations is interesting as well. We've done both qualitative and quantitative studies. Um, although the ACO leaders are talking about how they're changing the model of care a lot, how they've hired um, community health workers and care coordinators and all of this, in the AHA data, when we look at hospitals, not the entire or ACO organization. We actually don't see that occurring. So that's an interesting note. We do, um, from the qualitative interviews, however, know, particularly with the next gen pioneers, hearing loud and clear that the changes that they want to implement at the workforce level are really happening slowly because it is very difficult to justify to their chief financial officers that they are going to have an ROI on changing the staffing models because payment comes so um, in such a delayed manner. So if you have to wait for six months to a year to know whether or not you've had savings and whether or not you're going to have additional revenues, it's difficult to justify those, those workforce changes. So they seem to know where they want to go with this, but they're having difficulties actually um, sort of rolling it out because of the, of the internal conversation about the justifications. Um, we've done a series of, of um, studies on their staffing laws, and, and that has not actually been published yet, but we are really clearly seeing that the effect of these laws, whether they're mandates or their required staffing um, uh, committees or public reporting of staffing levels, uh, do have an effect on the nurse to patient staffing ratios. Um, we are also seeing, however, that they have an effect on the nurse support personnel. Um, suggesting that to some extent there's um, hospital decision level, uh, hospital level decision around staffing up uh, nurses, meaning that they would have less support staff. In other words, they're moving, moving the, the money around. And, um, and again, this is um, consistent with what we saw in terms of the national statistics in terms of the nurse support staff uh, declining. The Medicaid, we've looked at Medicaid expansion to see to what extent it changed staffing and to what extent it changed productivity. The uh, results are underwhelming. Certainly utilization has gone up in CHCs. Uh, we don't see major shifts in terms of how CHCs are staffed in states that have expanded Medicaid versus not. And we um, don't see a change in, in productivity. Um, a slight expansion in terms of the, the number of staff, but very small and really just barely covering it at all the, the increased utilization. So this has turned out not to be a major, a major change in terms of workforce issues. And then, of course, um, like everyone else, we've been very interested in understanding how scope of practice laws affect both staffing levels and productivity. Um, this is a, a complex area, particularly because you have to control for so many other variables. But at the level of the community health centers, um, when we model in different ways, we see a very small effect. When we model in particular by staffing, we, we cluster the CHCs by the type of staff that they have. In those CHCs that have very high physician ratios relative to other kinds of staff, we see an impact in terms of NP productivity in those places increasing where there is more uh, permissive scope of practice. In other kinds of CHCs that are either high advanced practice staff or high nurse, we don't see an effect. So it's somewhat um, like Medicaid expansion, it's a very marginal effect. It's kind of un underwhelming in terms of seeing either staffing levels or productivity. So, so that's the work we've done in the area of how policies are affecting workforce um, levels and configuration. The work that we're doing on outcomes is really um, where we want to go with all of this. And I know that this is what um, practitioners are clamoring to know. So we have a team of health economists that 
had been working on what we call a production function, which sort of looks at inputs and outputs and looks at workforce as the as if it was um, the, you know, the the point of the realm. And this approach is somewhat different than the the studies that have been done in the past on nurse staffing in that it's not a linear equation kind of a model. You actually get a curve. So you can see where you get the most bang for your buck at what point in terms of hours of a certain kind of personnel in relation to quality outcomes. Um, and at what point are the returns diminishing. And so um, we did this first in hospitals and we're working now uh, with the CHC data on primary care. And at the level of hospitals, um, similar to what others have found uh, before, uh, nurse staffing is very sensitive, in particular to different components of the age caps and pa the patient reported outcomes. Um, we we saw overall that the number of the percent of hospitals that are understaffed for an optimal level of this outcome is um, quite high. It's about seventy percent. Um, it, well, what I was really interested in, in terms of the substance of these findings, was that uh, in the age caps you have patient reported measures that are essentially about housekeeping types of activities, but you also have others that are more clinical in nature. For example, did you, um, were your um, med, the medications explained to you, were you given instructions upon discharge about how to handle uh, XYZ in terms of um, future consultations. And we found that the nursing assisted personnel, which um, was very um, sort of suboptimally staffed, was sensitive to all of these different measures. And the reason that is important is that obviously they would be sensitive to issues like, you know, was there was the housekeeping adequate? But one might not have expected the nursing assisted personnel to be so sensitive to outcomes that are really more related to the nurse work, like explaining medication side effects. So we. We think that this is an important uh, finding for hospital leaders to understand that there is a spillover effect of nursing assisted personnel on their performance on each cap, which of course matters in terms of um, in terms of the bottom line. Um, in the in the primary care setting in CHCs, we're um, just beginning to identify which outcomes are sensitive to workforce, and not surprisingly, it's primarily the process measures. Um, that rather than the end result of an outcome that are more sensitive. Um, and it just as kind of a flavor of what's coming because this study won't be over until uh, September of this year, we are finding that in centers that have, uh, that, well first, the first finding that was really interesting is that neither staffing up on physicians or staffing up on NPs and PAs makes a great deal of difference in terms of these outcomes. Uh, what does seem to make a great deal of difference is having the nurses um, support staff uh, uh, it, um, increased in relation in particular to NPs, less so for PAs and for physicians. And again, you know, we think that this is about something happening in teams that is really important and having clinicians have adequate support is a really key, I think, finding of this work um, early on. So obviously we're interested in this from a methodological perspective because we think that we can move around different settings and different kinds of health personnel to begin to understand their effect on outcomes. But I, we're hoping that this really expands the conversation about how many warm bodies we need where, but also about in what configuration, what kind of support staff. Um, so I wanted to just close with um, a few questions on this that we will be thinking about and that you all may also be thinking about and it would be interesting to hear some of you about, about where you think we should go with this with this research agenda. The first is that obviously while we're looking at quality outcomes we do need to include costs because the costs are about health services management and so that will be uh, beginning next year. We'll be starting to look at labor costs in relation to outcomes so that we can actually have, have some findings that are, um, uh, that are that are I think more practical in terms of decision making. Um, we are um, concerned about this finding that there's a decline in the nurse assistive uh, uh, personnel, particularly given what we found with the outcomes. And I think that the conversation around nurse staffing is um, largely going to be around nurse burst burnout. Um, in other words, we move from just the RN to patient ratio question to how do we um, have adequate support for nurses so that they don't burn out. Um, we've done a study that is looking at the um, NP and PA privileging that I hadn't mentioned before, but we're really interested in this. And essentially what we found is that in hospitals, there's gigantic variation in the way NPs and PAs are used 
in across the clinical area. And so, um, and that this is not associated with scope of practice laws. It's really a hospital level decision. So our next phase of work is really understanding not only the organizational predictors of that um, privileging variation, but also what the outcomes are um, in terms of health. Um, I particularly am interested in, and concerned about the possibility that despite the incredible increase in nurse practitioner graduation rates, um, they seem to be being gobbled up by all kinds of different sectors that are not in primary care or even in hospitals. Um, you know, everything from insurance companies to retail clinics, et cetera, and there seems to be an insatiable demand for this new kind of um, healthcare worker, and I think that, that we need to watch that closely. Um, and then finally, I would end with just sort of a big idea, which is, um, you know, as we think about our payment policies and how they affect the restructuring of the delivery system, I do think that the um, takeaway from our ACO leaders, uh, which is that this lag time you have to show savings is a, essentially a barrier to workforce transformation. So the the idea would be, is it is it possible to start baking in incentives or even requirements around some of these workforce changes that we are learning are effective uh, early into these payment policies, leaving it very open the way we do with PCMH and ACO right now. And I think that there are some states and some municipalities that are experimenting with this, and um, that's going to be an interesting area to watch. So um, with that, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions, but I know you have a lot of uh, speakers. Well, Dr. Pittman, we can have you hold on the line, and we'll bring it back for the Q&A uh, in about a, a half hour. We'll, we'll see if there are any questions for the audience then, but thanks for your talk. Um, we're going to move back into the room here with uh, Rochelle Andre, who's a program analyst with the Wisconsin, uh, Medical, uh, Wisconsin Council on Medical Education and the Workforce. You should be good to go. Great. Thank you, Sam, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Rochelle Andre. I work with uh, the Wisconsin Council of Medical Education and Workforce, also known as WICMU. Um, so in case you're not familiar with the organization, I will let you know who we are. Um, so WICMU is an organization that's a nonprofit and a collaboration that seeks to bring stakeholders who are interested in healthcare workforce together from all across the state in different, um, what might be silos traditionally. So we've got um, employers, the state of Wisconsin and many of the folks who are here on the panel with us today are also involved with WICMU. Um, and we are a convening organization as well as we do data analysis and develop recommendations as well. So um, our group meets four times a year. We discuss policy. We also have a lot of work groups that do um, engaging work on healthcare workforce policy in between. Um, you might be familiar with WICMU. One of the big initiatives was pushing forward graduate medical education or GME reform a few years ago and bringing in some more state dollars for funding of GME in Wisconsin. So um, in addition, just so you have a sense of what our scope is with WICMU, um, we generally do focus a little bit more on the primary care workforce and on clinicians that have a long run pipeline. So we're specifically primarily interested in physicians as well as pharmacy and advanced practice clinicians, including physician assistants, and nurse practitioners. So the reason we focus on those areas is just to give ourselves a bit of a guardrail. Um, we do work closely with other organizations, for example, Leading Edge Wisconsin, which is interested in long-term care. As we know, healthcare workforce decisions are never made in a vacuum. So when you tweak one piece of the healthcare workforce, um, you're definitely going to see ripple effects in all other areas. So we're aware of that and want to acknowledge that as well. So um, I think it's helpful to frame workforce both in Wisconsin and kind of nationally, at least for my own self, in terms of a few different levers. So um, otherwise, there's a lot of hodgepodge of policies and initiatives, I think. So um, the two different areas that I see um, most important as levers are, number one, increasing the utility of the current workforce. So sometimes I feel at least that this area doesn't get a whole lot of attention and may be overlooked. So that may look like um, using collaborative care models, a lot of what Dr. Pittman was referring to in terms of changing the mix of teams and using team-based care, as well as utilization of telehealth and electronic medical records, and then shifting workloads around. So, for example, um, having scribes in the workforce that can do more of the computing pieces. And then what we hear a lot about as well is increasing the total number of clinicians, so that's adding to the workforce pipeline. Um, I'll also make a note about provider retention, that's also a part of continuing to have people in the workforce who are there so we don't need to retrain them, and then avoiding churn where clinicians are 
seeking new jobs and losing some of their practice time in that process as well. So uh, what WICMU does a lot of in terms of data analysis is tracking, monitoring different trends in the workforce. So I'll just go over a little bit of supply and demand projections and also I know some of my colleagues here today will talk about the current state of you know, access and supply in Wisconsin as well. Um, but some of the supply factors that we look at are pipeline limitations. So that um, what we hear from our stakeholders is that um, there are a lot of limitations to um, faculty for training up new clinicians. Also, you'll hear more about the caps on graduate medical education or GME residency slots. So that limits the total fu uh, federal funding from Medicare for physicians in Wisconsin. That's now supplemented by state dollars as well. Um, we also hear from our stakeholders a lot of concerns about suboptimal um, uh, clinical site coordination. So there's a lot of time and energy spent in trying to find the hundreds of sites around Wisconsin that our nurses and physicians are going to be learning and practicing at. And that's a big energy suck for a lot of our educational institutions, as well as our hospitals and health systems to plan all that stuff. So that's all kind of in the pipeline category. Um, in terms of clinician demographics and changes in lifestyle preference, I'll point to this graph which shows the percentage of distribution for physicians by age and gender. So you can see that our older physicians um, are pretty much male, surprise. And then some of our younger physicians, we also have women coming into the workforce. So um, in addition to changing demographics of the workforce itself, there are also some changes in the preferences of clinicians. So the average physician works about 54 hours a week now, but that's been on the decline over the last decade and is trending lower and lower. As it turns out, clinicians are looking for a little bit more life balance. So that also impacts the total available time of clinicians um, seeing patients. And then finally, those burnout and retention issues as well are uh, supply factors too. And then in terms of uh, workforce demand, uh, we hear a lot about Wisconsin's aging population and that is, in my opinion, and many others, there. that's the primary driver for demand today. We know that older populations both demand more care, two to four times as much care as your average adult, as well as need more specialty care. So that may drive the mix of providers that we need in the workforce. There's also rural outmigration in Wisconsin as a key issue, so changing around where we see uh, clinicians and where we're going to need them most in the future. Um, this uh, graph is a projection with uh, physician demand as well as a, a supply scenario. So that blue line on the top is showing a calculation uh, for base demand just based on population demographics in the state of Wisconsin overall. And then that orange line just beneath it is a, a way to show demand if we could more effectively utilize uh, team-based care and telehealth. So that's driving down demand a little bit if we could really enact policies. This is just one projection of how we can calculate that. And then you'll see the green line on the bottom is a projection for uh, physician supply that incorporates those changes in lifestyle. So you'll actually see a decline in the total supply of physicians over time if we consider those, um, those preferences as well as the mix of clinicians. But there's a lot we can do to change that supply, which we'll go over today. Um, this is a map that you'll see in your packet. There's a big blow up of it. That is a projection for the change in demand for physician services in our counties across Wisconsin. A lot of the projections that we see now are for Wisconsin as a whole. And while that is very helpful, it does not really allow us to talk about variation in different places in Wisconsin. So of course we know that counties are pretty arbitrary political lines. It doesn't tell us a whole much about who's getting care and where, but it does start the discussion about how does care vary across Wisconsin. And there might be different policy levers that we need in different areas to address some of those needs. So what is WICMU doing with all of this in mind? Um, mostly we are bringing people together who traditionally are in silos or may work as competitors to address some of these issues together. So a few of the um, issues that we try to look at are interprofessional education. That's something we're looking at now because really the changes we make for today's students who are you know, going to become physicians or PAs, the changes we make to their curriculum aren't really going to have an effect on patients until 10 years down the road when they get through the pipeline 
and are practicing later on. So that's one of the reasons that we really are interested in looking at interprofessional education. So why would we um, educate students in silos and then expect them to work as teams in, in primary care and other areas? Um, we're also really interested in looking at what policies and practices inhibit clinicians' ability to practice at the full extent of their training, competencies, et cetera, within their employer setting. So there are all different kinds of policies, cultural norms, et cetera, that um, influence how different clinicians practice um, in their different areas of practice. And then what we hear a lot from our stakeholders is that there's really a desire to learn and um, learn from others and see best practices. So what are healthcare institutions learning that really works and how can that be applied in broader settings? And then how can some of these competitors see themselves as collaborators instead? So one great example of that is we're working with a consortia in northern Wisconsin that is looking to bring together hospitals to actually pool resources so they can set up new physician residency programs together. None of these hospitals or health systems alone it has the resources to staff up and do all the infrastructure and training that's required for accreditation of these programs, but together, if they could do recruitment and pooling of resources, that could be a huge asset to a lot of these institutions and to patients down the road. So a few of the policy considerations that I had asked we consider, um, again, thinking about both increasing the utility of the current workforce as well as adding to the pipeline would include really understanding what team-based care looks like in Wisconsin. So that may mean different mixes of workers or using our current workers in a new way, but we don't really have a way to measure what that looks like or how much is going on. So there's a lot of case studies about using team-based care in areas such as diabetes management or hypertension, but really what does it look like across the state of Wisconsin and how much is happening? We're not sure at this point. And is it useful? You know, what are the outcomes of team-based care? So another question, or just a consideration is continuing to fund the programs that are working such as the GME grants that we'll hear about more today. RIPRAP is a program that provides technical assistance for GME programs across Wisconsin. There are other grants that do similar activities, but these programs also need to be flexible and respond to the needs of both um, the hospitals and health systems as well as um, just changing care delivery reform. So could these programs pay for housing or other areas of the healthcare workforce that are really, really needed? So being nimble in that regard. Um, Additionally, really thinking about how healthcare workforce strategy and decision making um, happens day to day could give us some clues about how these decisions are made and how priorities are established. And then sharing best practices, as we know, is, is really important and so that folks can learn from each other along the way. Finally, incentivizing appropriate regional and specialty distribution. Appropriate is a bit of a cop out. That's the whole question is how do we define appropriate? If we train too many people, that's not an efficient use of resources. If we train too few, that's a problem as well. So um, that is what WISMU is all about, what we're working on. We're doing a lot of data and research, and we would always welcome your questions along the way. Here's how you can contact me. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, uh, Michelle. I appreciate the talk. Uh, next up, we have Ann Zank. She's the Vice President of Workforce and Clinical Practice for Wisconsin Hospital Association. All right, good afternoon. I thank the Evidence-Based Policy Project and SAM for pulling this day together, and I thank Senator Fine and all of you for taking the time to attend this workforce briefing. WHA continuously monitors Wisconsin's healthcare workforce. We watch research, educational efforts, legislative efforts, and we gather information from our members, which are hospitals and health systems across the state. Annually, since 2004, WHA compiles this information into a workforce report. This report includes recommendations for policymakers. Healthcare is really an important public infrastructure, like roads or schools, and it's critical that key stakeholders, like all of us, and policymakers support the changes necessary to address rapid, rapidly evolving healthcare workforce needs. When we think about what changes are needed to support and grow the workforce, WHA looks through the lens of practice. So what can a healthcare professional do based on education, training, and experience? Policy, state statutes and regulations, and payment. What can a health, health workforce professional practicing within their scope and providing healthcare within statute and regulation get reimbursed for? Health 
healthcare organizations design their care according to these three P's, but sometimes the data and workforce trends show that one of the P's needs to change to promote better care and better utilization of our healthcare workforce. Before we dig into the data, let's set the stage. What's driving workforce supply and demand? Um, factors driving demand for healthcare include uh, what we've all heard, aging, which brings complex and chronic conditions with it. We also know that more people in Wisconsin have health insurance and that drives a need for access. Finally, we know consumers are looking for access in a different way, through smartphones, through telemedicine, patient portals, access enhanced by technology. What about supply? Aging and technology also play a key role in supply. Um, we know from Rochelle and previous speaker that physician and provider shortages aren't just looming, they're here. We also see care continuing to move from the inpatient hospital world to outpatient. Um, and finally, the U.S. is working to move from a disease focus to a wellness focus, working to manage population health. So let's talk a little bit about the data. Um, what do we know about the healthcare workforce? Um, let's walk through a national timeline. We know that in 1990, manufacturing was the leader, leading employer in most states. By 2003, retail trade had taken over. Um, healthcare employment grew rapidly over the next decade. And by 2015, healthcare was the dominant industry in over half of the United States. In fact, healthcare was projected to lead national employment by 2024. Well, guess what? We didn't make it to 2024. In the last quarter of 2017, healthcare became America's largest employer. With healthcare jobs expected to increase by 30% by 2030, it's vital to support the growth of our healthcare workforce. We know we're already looking at a big gap between hiring and job openings in healthcare. In fact, if you look at the light blue bar um, next to the healthcare section, um, that shows separation, people leaving their jobs. The orange bar shows hires. So we know in healthcare that we're just keeping up, hiring is just keeping up with separation, and that there's a huge gap between uh, uh, what we can hire and new job openings, which is that dark blue graph or dark blue bar. So where are all the openings? WHA's Information Center coordinates the annual Wisconsin Hospital Survey, which includes vacancy rates for hospital professions, Ad advanced practice nurses, as we've heard of, about, certified nursing assistants, physician assistants, surgical techs, and licensed practical nurses have had the top five highest vacancy rates in Wisconsin for the past two years. Respiratory therapists joined the top five last year, tied for fifth with licensed practical nurses. Aging, we've heard about aging. We also collect uh, the percentage of hospital employed professionals over 55. Individuals over 55 might be in the workforce for a decade or more, but this benchmark provides employers and educators with lead time to prepare for retirement. Occupations with a higher percentage of healthcare individuals over 55 will need more people entering the workforce to prepare for future retirements. A third of certified registered nurse anesthetists, a type of advanced practice clinician, and a quarter of advanced practice nurses are older than 55. And as Rochelle said, the runway to them entering practice is longer. So it takes years to build up this segment of the workforce. As a nurse, this slide always makes me pretty happy because nurses are aging well. Uh, what that means is that about half of nurses are in the first 20 years of their career and half are in the last 20 years of their career. So uh, we're sustaining the nursing workforce with new members and we're keeping that experience available to share professional knowledge and history. So as you've heard, uh, some of the trends that policymakers should be aware of are the two important themes of, um, of healthcare teams and technology. It's important to think about that when we're making policy decisions. A team model of healthcare distributes the responsibility for patient care among an interdisciplinary team. The team makeup is fluid. It depends on what the patient needs. It can include physician assistants, um, physical therapists, physicians, dietitians, 
CNAs and CMAs. We also know about the primary care uh, shortage. And in a team-based model, that allows clinicians to delegate to non-provider members of the team within the scope of their training, experience, and education. Teams also use technology. For example, medical assistants can use a standard set of instructions approved by your physician to ask you about and schedule your mammogram. Or maybe you even schedule your own through an electronic portal. Fundamental to this team model is that all team members perform at the top of their skill level. We're fortunate to have legislators and regulatory agencies in Wisconsin that listen and interact. This is essential. Ensuring that our healthcare workforce can meet patient needs today and into the future relies on good public policy enacted by Wisconsin lawmakers protecting high quality high value healthcare for Wisconsin citizens. I'm gonna close with some examples and recommendations from WHA's annual workforce report and examples from partnerships between the state, healthcare providers and educational entities, all through the lens of the three Ps. So we know we need to attract and retain workers to the healthcare workforce. And with an aging workforce, we need to address physician and advanced practice clinician shortages now. So in 2013, WHA hospitals, urged by WHA hospitals and health systems, educational institutions, and health associations, like with me and the Medical Society of Wisconsin, policymakers created a matching grant opportunity to grow our own physicians. Data shows that 86% of uh, people who attend medical school in Wisconsin complete their residency in Wisconsin, stay in Wisconsin and practice as a physician. We also know that the 86% drops by 30% if uh, future physicians leave the state for their residency. So the great news is that the Grow Our Own strategy worked. Policymakers' investment and partnerships with Wisconsin's healthcare organizations and medical schools have created 76 more residency slots. That's 76 more physicians in Wisconsin than would otherwise have been available. So in 2017, WHA led efforts with other key stakeholders like WICMU and the Rural Health Co-op to expand the GME program and to create a new program as part of the Rural Wisconsin Initiative. These matching grant partnerships will allow healthcare facilities and educational institutions create the infrastructure necessary to provide training spots and support the training of advanced practice clinicians and allied health professionals, like CNAs, CMAs, and respiratory therapists that, that staff needed to support care in our facilities. Again, remember that key to all of this is that members of the healthcare team can practice at the top of their training and experience. Legislation that Governor Walker signed into law last June is a great example of this. Dental hygienists are an important part of population health and the shift from disease to wellness. And hygien hygienists could already provide preventative care in schools, for example, without the presence of a dentist. With this new law, dental hygienists can support dental health in additional settings, like primary care clinics, nursing homes, and hospitals, taking care, taking care to where the patient is. So finally, uh, look at how we can better support teams and technology. Leveraging all licensed clinicians' training and experience is essential in team-based models of care, but we know that regulations don't always keep up with how fast our technology moves or how we use advanced practice clinicians in our setting. So in 2017, WHA helped advance legislation that made clear that advanced practice clinicians can provide care and submit billing for Medicaid without a physician's co-signature. This was already accepted and recognized practice. And it doesn't seem like such a big deal until you're setting up your electronic health records to support billing to Medicaid. And so we um, wanted to make sure that it was very clear that this was allowed and we got that law changed. <clears throat> so when policymakers think about supporting technology so that technology can support the workforce. Oh, I think this isn't working. Oh, there it went, sorry. 
just need to pick it up. So when policymakers think about supporting technology so that technology can support the workforce, for instance, telemedicine, smartphones, all those things we've heard about, it's important that reimbursement and practice rules evolve also. And of course, none of that technology exists without broadband access. So policymakers should give funding priority to underserved healthcare areas where technology can be used to maximize the available healthcare workforce. I thank you for your time today and I hope I have given you some food for thought. Thanks very much, Ms. Zink. Appreciate uh, your comments. And next up we'll have Sarah Colliner uh, from the Department of Health Services. Hello, uh, thank you for having us. My name is Sarah Colliner. I'm the Policy Section Chief in the Office of Policy and Practice Alignment in the Division of Public Health. And I'm joined today by with Jamie Olson, who is our Primary Care uh, Program Coordinator. And I know that um, a question we sometimes get when it comes to uh, the Public Health uh, Division is, is a surprise, I guess, at the fact that we have the Primary Care Program because uh, it is a more clinical view. And I only ask that you think about the fact that um, between us, screenings and prophylactic treatment, uh, chronic disease maintenance, coordination of care. This is really the foundation of promoting and protecting the health and safety of the people of Wisconsin, which is our mission. And so it's actually a really great fit, and I'm excited to tell you what we're doing um, in that program as well as outside of it today. So I won't go too into the gap because I feel like we pretty much addressed it in the last few minutes, um, but it's true that um, we already need to make sure that because this is an essential service that we're meeting access needs to primary care, which also includes dental and mental health care. Um, and there are, are places where they need it most because of an aging population uh, where the doctors may not be there for them. And in particular, I'm, um, I see that by 2025, 40 to 50% of populations in eight Wisconsin counties could be over the age of 65. So this is in a sense, a geographical problem, which comes back to this idea um, that we're looking at this afternoon, which is getting the right providers in the right areas. Um, that's, that's part of the issue. And so what we're doing about it is um, a lot of what happens in the Wisconsin primary care program, and a lot of it is centered on establishing these healthcare shortages, identifying where they are. And so I'll go into a little bit more detail about um, how we designate one type of um, shortage, but it does feed into the other benefits that we're able to kind of help guide um, with that identifying of where the shortages are, shortages in primary care access. And so that includes our Conrad 30 program, which is a J-1 visa waiver that allows graduates of foreign medical colleges who have done their residencies in Wisconsin to go right into um, working in Wisconsin communities that need it as opposed to waiting for two years. There's also the National Health Service Corps. And even though we don't um, actually coordinate that program, it does rely on funding that is in part um, designated by the scores that we uh, receive for the shortages that we have as a, as a recognition of the urgency of those shortages. And so it's important that we are able to identify them so that the places are getting enough money to help on um, programs like this, which help with um, loan repayment services for providers. We also have the Community Health Center grant, and that's uh, $5.8 million, that's, sorry, $5.4 million distributed to 18 agencies. And those agencies do have to be receiving um, some uh, a federal uh, designation of being a, a community health center. And that means having to be in a designated shortage area. So it's all very connected. Um, but because uh, obviously access is an individual issue, uh, we also have a, uh, the volunteer health care provider liability program. And that's really targeted at the providers that are serving our free and charitable clinics. Because sometimes, even if you're in an area that has enough doctors Overall, it may not necessarily have enough doctors for everybody, and so we're able to help the providers at those clinics um, kind of cover their medical insurance costs so that um, it's e easier for them to provide access to services. And so that's inside the primary care program, but outside of it, we also uh, do manage the graduate medical education um, dollars that were provided through legislation, um, and I know that we've already talked about that a little bit. Um, but it is another tool in our toolkit that I'm excited to talk about. So there are many different kinds of shortage designations. There's a medically underserved population, there's a health professional shortage area, there's a gover governor's designated shortage area, and um, I'm only going to talk about the health professional shortage area, but no, they're, they're all um, quite different, uh, but still kind of trying to address the same issue. 
So AHIPSA, as I like to call it, is designated for primary care, mental health, and dental health. And that means actually looking at the ratio of either uh, physicians, psychiatrists, or dentists to the population in an area. And once we have that ratio established, we're able to take other information, like the Medicaid coverage, um, the, the special needs of that population, the cultural needs of that population, the geography, and take that into to a, a bigger picture of what this access to care looks like in this area. So we are really benefited by uh, surveys that are done by the uh, Wisconsin Primary Health Care Association who uh, look at the FTE um, and the clinics in an area, as well as demographics such as are they close to retirement age, uh, in order to kind of assess uh, what, the, what the provider um, layout is in an area. And we give that to HRSA, who then combines that with um, census data and other health information to give a really great picture of, of whether this area needs more programmatic support. And so uh, once, a desi once a designation is designated, uh, you also get a score. And that HIPSA score is going to help us get some of the benefits um, to show that not only is this a shortage, but it's an urgent one. And so some of those benefits uh, can be categorized between three uh, large categor categories, uh, which includes recruitment and retention tools. And so, like I said, that's the loan repayment, where you can have um, people that work in certain places and might get their medical loans um, repaid. Uh, and then the J-1 visa waivers. And just so to show how high, uh, high, de I, high in demand uh, those, those waivers are, in this last year, uh, we have 30 to give. And in previous years, not all 30 were claimed. In this year, all 30 were claimed in six weeks of opening. So it's obviously needed. Uh, we can also, uh, by having a shortage area designated with certain scores, uh, receive Medicare and Medicaid bonus payments to services by providers in those areas. And clinics in those areas can be designated as a community health center, which we talked about gives them more access to um, some funds, as well as rural health clinics which helps expand the services that are provided in those areas. So here's a map of the um, primary health care HIPSA. And as I go through the primary mental health and dental HIPSAs, I just want to just remark on the fact that these are very different maps because the colored areas where the HIPSAs are, uh, we have to always think about the specific issue. Access to care is important, but it's not well addressed unless we're thinking in terms of the specific care needed. So you'll see that's mental health care and then there's dental. So um, moving on to our graduate medical education topic, um, I don't want to put too much time onto this except if you really just hammer in that this is a very um, well-evidenced tool in order to make sure that we have providers not just um, coming but staying in Wisconsin. 37% of physicians who complete their education in Wisconsin continue to practice in Wisconsin. 45% who complete their graduate medical education in Wisconsin, continue to practice in Wisconsin. People who uh, both do their graduate, uh, who graduate from medical school and then do their graduate education in Wisconsin, 71% uh, of them will continue to practice in a setting very similar to where they did their residency, which is really why it's important to have that rural clinic experience for them. And it's what our, our residents are trying to uh, provide. And so that comes in the form of $2.5 million uh, to support not just um, new uh, positions, but also entirely new programs across the state of Wisconsin. So in 2017-19, um, the budget did pass some more training, and this is specifically for um, the Advanced Practice Clinician Training and the Allied Health Professional Education and Training, and that's because it's important that we also stay innovative and we address modern healthcare innovations to making sure that we can provide access to care um, in the way that's very efficient and, um, and makes the most use of our resources. Um, and we also added addiction specialties to, uh, I should mention, uh, family practice, psychiatry, and general surgery residencies because it's important that we also address the priorities that we're facing right now. And so here's a map of our graduate medical education places. And I just wanted to remark on the fact that even though we do have to make sure the programs are housed in a medical college, which is always going to look a little more urban than other parts of Wisconsin, you can see from the colored areas, the colored counties where these residencies are established, that it's really allowing um, new graduate students to go out and experience um, places where the programs wouldn't necessarily be able to go without this additional support. 
So to leave you with a few emerging issues, um, again, the aging workforce, it's um, another reason why it's important to address this gap and another reason why it's important to work with partners. And we are excited to work with um, uh, organizations like WICMU and um, UHA and our rural health uh, cooperative because it's um, allowing us to really get to the problem at all angles in order to make sure that we are going to um, improve access um, in any way, any way we can. Um, and then another issue that's going to happen is that HRSA is actually standardizing the HIPSA process a little bit more, and that's by just relying more on the data that we provide in order to uh, be agile and efficient with identifying where the shortages are. And so that's really allowed us to be creative in looking at new data sources like Medicaid claims to really demonstrate the needs that we have in Wisconsin to make sure they're getting access to those programs that we have. Um, but at the same time, there are some regions that, thanks to all of these tools, are having their shortages addressed. And so if there's some homework I can give to you today, it would be to think about how are we going to ensure that the regions that address these shortages and are no longer designated as, as a shortage area um, can really self-sustain with those provider levels. So thank you for your time. And if you, can, uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to follow up with us at DHS Primary Care Office at dhs.wisconsin.gov. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Ms. Connor, for that presentation. In the interest of time, we'll maybe take a break for one or two questions. I don't know if uh, Senator Miller or other staff might have a question. I, I do have a question for the first presenter. Um, you talked about uh, improve, uh, uh, the better outcomes were the result, and I couldn't tell from the presentation whether or not those improved outcomes were improved outcomes in terms of workforce deployment or improved outcomes in terms of patient results. Um, it, they were in terms of patient results. So the studies that we did in the hospital were the what are called the HCAP measures, which are, I think, the 12 um, questions for, that are patient reported. And we used six of them that were specific to nursing care and nursing support care. Um, so we, we do call those outcomes. And of course, there's payment linked to HCAPs as um, uh, for Medicare. And in the case of primary care, we were looking at control of diabetes, control of hypertension, uh, prenatal control, things of that sort. So they're not exactly health, health, health outcomes. We call them process measures, um, but they are predictors of health of the ultimate health outcomes. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if there's anyone in the audience. Otherwise, we can hold uh, to the end. There's one in the corner there. I just, yeah, we're going to speak up. Please. I want to tackle that. Uh, Dr. Pittman, I'm not sure if you were able to hear much of that question. I was not able to hear it at all. I'm okay. sorry. Um, is there any perspective you have on, on community health uh, community health workers? Uh, oh. Community-based direct care workers. I wonder if they can offer some perspective on their role in the, in, uh, the workforce and, and from your research or from some of your Sure. Your yeah, I should have mentioned that, that we have done some work in that area. Um, I mean, essentially, what well, we did a study for the Office of Minority Health a couple of years ago, where we inventoried uh, programs that were using CHWs, and obviously there is a huge change in the degree to which um, they are being uh, leveraged in our healthcare system. And the big story, I think, is that they're being integrated in new ways. Um, whereas this is an occupation that has been in existence for some time, um, they were not employed to the same degree that they are now by primary care organizations, hospitals, and even health plans are, are particularly the MCOs, the managed care organizations are hiring CHWs. So there's a lot of movement in this area. Um, there's some, there's some um, 
uh, randomized clinical trials that have been done that show really positive outcomes. Unfortunately, they are in specific models in one site. And one of the things that we found was that they are used in incredibly, incredibly diverse models. Um, and so and I think a really important area for us to be thinking about is to try to standardize these different models so we can begin to evaluate them. Um, a big issue as well is that, of course, the the concern is that, um, you know, what has made these workers unique and different from, from anyone else in the healthcare workforce is that they are um, part of the community and they have the trust of the community. Um, they are really peers. And I think what we're seeing is increasingly um, people are being hired and called community health workers that don't have those characteristics. And so that so there's some concern that the sort of the magic um, ingredient could be lost in this fervor for you using um, more and more CHW. So I think that there, particularly among the CHW leaders, is a lot of interest in trying to make sure that as we increase our interest in CHWs, we also don't change the nature of what their work is. Um, the other thing is that to the degree that, that they are integrated and actually employed by places like hospitals, that um, there are additional competencies that they have to have that they may, may not have needed before. I mean, for example, they need to be able to be technologically savvy and enter data into an electronic health record. They need to understand issues around fraud and privacy. And all of that, again, um, means that there is possibly a different kind of a hiring criteria when you look for CHWs. Um, so this is, um, you know, sort of a, an area that uh, people are, um, you know, it's inevitable. There's no way around it. It's not good or bad. It just is what it is. But it does mean that the um, the promise of this particular kind of health personnel um, um, is is probably um, only delivered to the extent that we respect the, the the unique character of its origins and don't uh, make it into an administrative type person or a or a low paid clinical type person. Um, so a lot of it is about communicating what the goals are for this kind of a worker. But there's no question that it is there's a there's a um, huge surge of interest in in employing CHWs. We'll probably move on. Uh, we'll, we'll maybe come back to that issue at the final Q and A. Thanks for that response, Dr. Pittman. Let's spend the second half of the briefing uh, looking at some career pathway programs for healthcare providers in our state. And we'll start off with Dr. Susan Zahner. Dr. Zahner is the uh, Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and the Vilas Achievement, uh, Distinguished Achievement Professor at the UW-Madison School of Nursing. Well, thank you, Sam. And thank you uh, for organizing this panel and inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the nursing workforce. Um, the registered nurse workforce numbers around 90,000 here in Wisconsin. And the numbers are going up very gradually. Uh, just over half of those nurses work in hospitals. We have about 5,000, just over 5,000 advanced practice registered nurses. These are nurses that are educated and credentialed to practice nursing in an advanced uh, level. Most are nurse practitioners. The numbers of nurse practitioners and other advanced practice nurses is increasing. We've had about a 19% increase over the last two years. We have just over a thousand uh, RNs that report working primarily as faculty in nursing schools and most are prepared at the master's level. We have some geographic issues uh, with nurses in our distribution. The, the lowest um, nurse per population ratio is in the northeast region of the state and the highest is in the southern region of the state. So what's, what's behind some of these numbers um, is some uh, concerning gaps about the future. Um, current forecasts by the Wisconsin Center for Nursing show a deficit of 3,700 3, nurses by 2020 and over 16,000 by 2030. National uh, surveys that are uh, modeling uh, forecasts that use a little different methodology also show a shortage of nurses by 2030 of almost 5,000. So these are concerning numbers. Um, we have a graduation capacity gap in the state. We only graduate around 3,000 nurses a year in Wisconsin. We have 20 baccalaureate programs, 22 associate degree programs, and 15 um, associate degree to baccalaureate um, degree uh, programs. So schools continue to turn away many, many hundreds of qualified students. 
Um, we lack faculty uh, and lack of clinical placement sites are the two most frequently cited reasons for not graduating more RNs. Um, we, in terms of the advanced practice nurses, uh, the state average of nurses here is 10% of RNs versus, I'm sorry, in nationally is 10% of RNs. In Wisconsin, it's 6% of RNs. So we're not quite keeping up with the national averages in terms of the number of nurses per, or number of advanced nurses we have compared to the nurse um, workforce. This may be due to our limitations in our scope of practice law. Um, we have some issues around diversity of our workforce as well. Although we're seeing slow change, the diversity of our nurse workforce doesn't reflect the state's diversity in either race, ethnicity, or gender. We also have a little concern with our um, educational levels. The Institute of Medicine and others have recommended for many years that we have um, most of our nurses, 80% of our nurses, be educated at a baccalaureate level for the generalist nursing practice. Right now we have 56% of our nurses with a baccalaureate degree. It's changing. The younger nurses that are graduating now, 66% of them are coming out of baccalaureate programs compared to 33% from associate degree programs. So it's moving in the right direction, but we still lag behind that national goal. I think we've talked already about the demand drivers for more nurses. It's the same kind of drivers that are affecting the other health professions. On the supply side, we have slightly different um, supply drivers. I think uh, the demographics certainly affect nurses as well as everybody else, but the average age of a nurse now is 47, and the average age for a faculty member is 51. In our RN survey in 2016, we found that 58% of nurses and 59% of nurse faculty expressed an intent to leave their positions within the next nine years. So some of this is due to retirement, some of this is due to dissatisfaction, um, and probably a number of other reasons as well. Job satisfaction, burnout, stress, fatigue, chronic pain, and safety concerns all contribute to nurses leaving their jobs and leaving the profession. And this is a particular concern among new nurses, with 50, 30 to 50 percent of new nurses changing jobs or leaving nursing within the first three years. We spend a lot of time educating them, and then they decide it's, it's too hard once they get out. So we really need to look at that. It's also a problem for aging nurses. Um, even though we may be aging well, it's more and more difficult for nurses as they age to uh, uh, sustain practice in some areas because of fatigue, because of uh, chronic pain, and other kinds of safety concerns. We need to look at how we, how we help our aging nurses nurse better. Um, we have the faculty shortage, which is what I talked about, that's creating this bottleneck of getting more students out the door. Economics plays a part in nurses as well. In times of, re of recession, nurses tend to come back into the workforce if they've left the workforce. And in times of economic boons, nurses leave the workforce. As our economy improves, we may see some of that shifting of nurses back out of the workforce. Um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes because I was asked to, to talk about what the School of Nursing is doing, and this is an example. There are schools of nursing all across the state that are doing really great things to try to address these workforce issues. Uh, first of all, of course, we educate nurses for practice as generalist nurses, as advanced practice nurses in geriatrics, mental health, and pediatrics, and as PhD prepared faculty and researchers. We've increased our baccalaureate uh, nurse enrollment. Uh, we now admit 160 uh, students per year. But as I mentioned, we turn away many qualified applicants. We turn away um, three qualified applicants for every one that we admit. Over the past five years, we've turned away 950 qualified students to be nurses. And this is because we don't have sufficient uh, resources to train these um, students. Um, and that's with regard to both uh, faculty and clinical placement. We have started an accelerated BSN program. So this is for second degree students. It'll take 12 months for them to complete this program. We're starting this in May. We're starting with 32 students, and we will likely increase this program over time. So that's going to help us get more nurses out the door faster. We also co uh, collaborate with other schools in, this, in the state um, with the AD completion program called BSN at Home. This is an online program. It's available to anybody anywhere in the state. And we have capacity in that program, so we'd like to get more students into that. We're also trying to get faculty uh, trained and up and out the door faster. We have an early entry PhD program where we identify students in their baccalaureate program and help them uh, 
get work through and learn how to be a researcher and how to be a faculty member and get them out the door earlier so they can have a longer career as a nurse faculty. We are dealing, trying to deal with the diversity issues as well. We have a long history of working with campus on the people program for middle and high school students to keep them interested in nursing as a career. And our, our classes are actually um, getting more um, increasingly diverse. Our current class is 18% male, 70% students of color, and 33% students, um, first generation students. So we're making some headway there. We're going to continue to work hard in that area. We started a process called Holistic Admissions, which is an evidence-based approach to enhance diversity in nursing uh, student classes. Um, with this recent class for the accelerated program was done with holistic admissions and it's resulted in a class that is, that is more diverse than our traditional class. We're also doing a lot of supportive uh, programming for students. One example is STREAM and that's a new program uh, where Native American students who want to become nurses um, engage in special activities, have a mentor who's a Native American RN, have individualized planning and a stipend and we're going to hear more about uh, the Native American um, students later. Of course, we also do a lot with scholarships. Um, it's another way we support students at all of our levels. However, the demand for scholarship funding is a lot higher than what we have available. We're trying to get students out to areas that we know it's harder to recruit um, nurses into. We do a summer immersion program in rural Wisconsin, uh, Barron and Rust counties, where we take students out for three weeks and introduce them to rural nursing and public health nursing. Um, we're also using simulation more and more. Uh, we're using it to enhance and extend nurse or education experiences and try to reduce that demand on the clinical uh, preceptors and clinical sites. So I just want to touch on two additional examples of faculty-initiated uh, projects where faculty will write grants and bring new federal and foundation money into the state to do these projects that contribute to uh, nurse retention and satisfaction issues. So one example is what we call, or what is called e-school care. Lori Anderson from our faculty to use federal funds to develop a web-based mobile resources for school nurses. Um, a second example is the Jerry Res program. This is an online nurse residency curriculum for nurses in long-term care, uh, created by Barb Bowers and Kim Nolet using uh, Cargill Foundation funding. And there are tracks in this program for nurses and, and their coaches in skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, and in-home health. We uh, really appreciate the comment made about the community workers and how important they are. Um, so just to end then with some considerations for um, policymakers, I think we really need to focus on two, two big areas. One is um, investing in nursing education to get more nurses out the door. The other is in, in, um, investing in our currently practicing nurses to keep them where they are. So more faculty is key to uh, addressing the nursing shortage and the factors necessary for increasing faculty include support for education, grants, loans, fellowships, scholarships, loan forgiveness programs. Um, the program Nurses for Wisconsin was a great start in that area. So those are very important programs uh, to, for faculty. Uh, earlier entry to graduate programs to extend career time as faculty is helpful. And of course, competitive salaries and other incentives, incentives for academic careers, because we know that actually about two thirds of DNP um, student graduates and about the same uh, percentage of PhD graduates actually pursue non-academic, non-teaching careers. So we've got to produce a lot more of them to get our faculty up. Um, more support for uh, uh, BSN education, scholarships, rural training programs, nurse residency programs are really important to new graduates. They look for places that have a nurse residency program. It's a great tool for recruitment and retention. And also organizational partnerships to support students and preceptors and clinical placements is something that we're really working on um, with our partners here. Um, I think in terms of other uh, policy or considerations for policymakers related to the practicing nurse, data is vital in any planning and evaluation uh, processes. A lot of our data has been coming from the mandated RN survey, relicensure survey. Um, this has been extremely important data to the state. Um, we need to maintain and enhance Wisconsin's workforce data centers. We need to support new nurses. This is really important. Acute care residencies, um, as I mentioned, have been shown to improve retention, lower costs, and improve preparedness for practice. 
Um, we could also use that residency model more in rural areas, in long-term care, for public health, for many other specialties where it's hard to find and retain nurses. And we need to look for uh, additional ways to support nurses and improve job satisfaction in order to reduce that turnover. Better salaries, better benefits, better work environments where nurses have a say in patient care decisions and a variety of programs that address nurses as they age to stay healthy and active in the workforce. In the rural areas, I think peer support network is, networks would help and also um, ongoing continuing education opportunities. So, and then finally, just with the advanced practice nurses, I think we do still need to look at that reduced practice uh, laws that restrict our practice because I think states where um, those restrictions are gone are more likely to attract uh, nurse practitioners to practice. So if we did something about that law, we'd probably attract more nurse practitioners to practice in our state. And finally, I just have to put a, a shout out for school nurses. For every dollar invested in school nursing, society saves $2.20. So only 60% of our schools have school nurses. I think the whole state could benefit if we had more of our schools with school nurses. So just to summarize, the, two, the key points are the nursing shortage is going to get worse unless we invest more in nursing education and invest more in the retention of practicing nurses through working conditions and residencies and so on. Um, and I think we need to maintain our efforts to continue to collect workforce data uh, so that we can know whether changes we made make a difference. So thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Zahner. Um, moving along to Dr. Uh, Bill Houston. He's the Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education and the Associate Provost of Education at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Thanks Thank for making the drive in and take it away. So let me, let me first give you a little bit of background on Medical College of Wisconsin for those who aren't familiar with it. We are in Milwaukee, but we also have regional campuses now in Green Bay, which is in our third year, and Wausau in the second year. We have three schools at the Medical College of Wisconsin, our School of Medicine, which includes both the medical school and anesthesia assistant program, or our second year of anesthesia assistant training. Anesthesia assistants are basically physician assistants who work in the operating room with anesthetists. Uh, that's a small program. It's one of only 11 in the country at this time. Uh, we have a graduate school of biomedical studies, primarily for PhD students, but also for MPH students and masters of uh, art students in uh, areas such as uh, ethics and other areas. And then we have a school of pharmacy that just enrolled its first class this year of 50 students. And I'll talk a little bit more about that pharmacy program and our rationale for doing that. Uh, we're a research intensive university bringing about $250 million to the area in research funding. Today, I want to focus on three programs that we have at MCW that relate to workforce development and workforce promotion. The first is the development of our two regional campuses in Green Bay and in central Wisconsin, which is uh, in Wausau. And while I put these up as regional campuses in Green Bay and Wisconsin, you know, in Wausau, the clinical training sites for these two campuses extend as far west as Eau Claire and as far northeast up into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So it's really the upper half of the state that is our target, not just Green Bay and Wausau. And I'll spend most of the time on that of my allotted 10 minutes. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about the pipeline programs that we have to develop students from underrepresented backgrounds in medicine who are in Southeast Wisconsin to get them into health professions, uh, specifically into medicine, pharmacy, and into research careers. And then I wanna spend just a couple seconds focusing on our School of Pharmacy and how that's different than other schools of pharmacy. And our vision for our graduates are going to be different providers than the typical pharmacist graduating from a pharmacy program and how that will have an impact, we hope, on workforce development. So let's start with our regional campuses. Uh, we're really responding to a call from the Association of Medical Medical Colleges uh, about a decade or so ago that said we needed to increase the number of physicians by 30%. And that's mainly to meet many of the supply demands we already talked about, an aging population, for example. So most medical schools have gone out, and we've really responded to that challenge. The number of medical students is up 30% since this call, and that's through the development of new medical schools, and primarily by a, a strategy of just expanding your current medical school by up to 30% to put more people in there. Uh, the problem with this is that we continue to educate people the same way we always have. We're going to get the same results. So if we have gaps in our service delivery, if we have gaps in the disciplines that we need to deliver that care, we're not going to solve it by producing 30% more of what we have now. We have to have a different strategy if we're going to have physicians locate 
in geographic underserved areas and go into areas of medicine that are now underpopulated by physicians, such as primary care and psychiatry. So MCW took a different tact. Rather than putting 30% more seats in our classrooms, we decided to put more students where we need more doctors and partner with communities to develop the kind of doctors they need, uh, admit the kind of students who are likely to stay in that area that are selected by people in those communities, and develop them in an immersive environment where they hopefully go into practice where we need them in specialties that are needed in those areas. So our, UW, our MCW Green Bay campus opened in July 2015 and Central Wisconsin opened the following year. The other tact we've taken to make this a little unique, actually very unique because this is the only campuses in the country that use this model, is we're going to educate the students in three years instead of four. We're actually we're having a curriculum that motivated students who know what they want to go into can complete it in three years. It's not an obligation to complete it in three years, but our expectation is that the majority of students will finish this program in three years, which will save them a year of tuition. So we want to reduce the cost of education so students who want to go into specialties that aren't paid as well don't have as big a debt burden when they go out. So instead of in the fourth year of a program, these students will not be paying tuition, they will be getting paid to be residents. It's about a $100,000 difference in that one year. That's actually not the biggest payback. The biggest payback comes several years later when their peers who started medical school with them in four-year programs are still in their residency, and these folks are in practice. And the differential between what you're making in practice and what you make as a resident is a lot bigger than $100,000 a year. So the minimum gain in, in financial reward of students doing a three-year program is minimum of $200,000, likely more, in the course of their training experience. So we want these students to be able to come out two specialists that they love and they care to go into and not go into it because they're paid more here or paid less there. They will do well wherever they go into. Uh, campus features also are, are a little bit different. Uh, we didn't want to go out and develop campuses de novo with everything that a medical school campus has. We wanted to take advantage of all of the infrastructure that we have and all the infrastructure that exists in those communities. We want to partner with the communities so that the educational resources that are there can be leveraged by us to train our medical students. Instead of developing faculty members who can teach on all those campuses and give lectures, we use distance education technology. So if a lecture is delivered, it's delivered once, and can, people from all three campuses participate in that lecture. That reduces the cost significantly because we're not tripling our faculty numbers. Most of our lectures now emanate from Milwaukee, but a surprise to Milwaukee is that it turns out the distance education lines go both ways. And there are people on our regional campuses who are very knowledgeable and have a lot of expertise in the topics that our students want to hear about. And some of our material now emanates from Green Bay and central Wisconsin coming back to Milwaukee. So we also have the advantage of we can take care of the best teachers in any site to teach all of our students. So we're using that to reduce the cost of education by replicating faculty over and over again, but we're also capitalizing on the existing clinical resources and educational resources in those towns. We have faculty members who work with us <clears throat> we're in two-year colleges, private colleges, and UW branches in Wausau and in Green Bay who teach our medical students in small groups and teach them clinically. So we're not there to duplicate what's there. We're there to use what's there efficiently. Second area I want to touch upon is our pipeline program in Southeast Wisconsin. It's nice to have a lot of students and it's good to put them in the right place, but we also have to get the right students into medical school. We have a big diversity problem in medicine. That's why we have underrepresented medicine groups. Uh, what we need to do is develop pipeline programs, ways to increase the ability of students who come from lower income backgrounds or from rural areas who don't have a family tradition of going into higher education first in their, their family to go to college, to be able to get the kind of training, get the kind of exposure in medicine, get the kind of exposure to research experiences and clinical experiences before they go to medical school that will make them good candidates for medical school and make them more successful medical students. We have three such programs uh, that are listed up here that start in early high school, later high school, and federally funded program for college students that capitalize on the summer students. So students come to our campus in June, July, and August, 
and participate in these, and they are funded. They, the students get stipends for participating. What we've lacked is something during the school year. So they go back to school, and we don't see them again until the next summer. What we've developed is Step Up There, which is the Student Enrichment Programs for Underrepresented Professions, which I always have to print up there because I can never remember what Step Up stands for, even though I'm the one who came up with the term. Uh, what we're doing here is bringing in junior high school students, high school students, and college students for a longitudinal program through the academic year for Science Saturdays throughout the year and exposing them to, in early stages, basic science concepts and health, pro health profession careers in high school areas or in-depth science education that they might be getting at their high school and in college, more in-depth college experiences, shadowing of physicians so they get clinical experiences in college and preparation for the college aptitude admissions testing. So we wanna take these students and give them every chance they can get that everyone else gets in this country to go to medical school. So our target group, as I said, goes all the way to junior high school. So as we heard earlier, you can't wait till these folks are in college and then start getting them interested in health professions. And you can't start giving them a good foundation once they're in college. You have to get good foundation in junior high school. We have partners in our school system in Milwaukee County, partner schools who identify talented and committed students and parents, because this is not just for students. We also include parents in this program who enroll and go through junior high school and then graduate into our high school program and then hopefully we'll graduate into the college partners we have in the Milwaukee area and then hopefully come to medical school and if they come to MCW that would be great if they go to UW that would be great the important thing is that they become health profession providers not where they go to school currently we have about 80 students in our program and this is our second year of enrolling students so we're uh, feeling pretty good about the number of folks here we don't have any outcomes of how many are going into health professions education programs right now. Most of them are probably still 14, 15, 18 years old. And hopefully they're not physician shipped. Uh, pharmacy school, our goal in, in standing up a pharmacy school isn't to just be another pharmacy school. Our goal is to produce the pharmacist of the future, a healthcare provider who will be an integral member of healthcare teams managing the medical and pharmacological issues of their patients. So somebody who doesn't see patients in my clinic after I write a prescription, but sees patients before I write a prescription so that I write the right prescription. And so we organize their medications in a way that will be safest for the patient and most effective for their care. So we're integrating the education of these students with our medical students throughout their training. And we hope that uh, the first class will graduate in 2017 because again, Instead of a four-year typical program, this is a three-year program. We want to get these students out so their debt burden is lower, they're in practice earlier, and they're providing care to people. So consideration for policymakers. And before I get into this, uh, let me just give one word here, a note of appreciation to our legislature. Uh, when we started out looking at our regional campuses, we knew that we couldn't go this alone. Building infrastructure is expensive. The legislature stepped up and uh, provided $7.4 million in matching funds for us to build infrastructure at these campuses. So we're indebted to the legislature to getting this kick-started and really building the structure that has supported these campuses in the long run. But the kind of things we need to work on is having physicians with the right skills in the right place that meet the needs of our communities. As I said, if we can keep producing the same kind of physicians we have now, we'll have more of the same thing. We won't address any of those gaps. In fact, over time, those gaps will probably get bigger. One of the issues that we have in all medical schools now is the debt burden of our graduates. Uh, average debt of a medical student, student across the country now finishing fourth year of medical school is $180,000. So when people say they're mortgaging their future, they are really mortgaging their future. That's as much as a mortgage on someone's home. And they are paying that off over the next 30 years, just like you're paying off a mortgage. When you have that kind of debt burden, two things happen. It may influence your future career choice. You don't have the leisure of going to something that may pay less in another area or locate in the area where your income might not be as high. The second is, frankly, it scares away people who aren't high income. If someone's from a high income family and they look at a debt low of 180000 and their family member says, ah, that's, a, you know, that's a mortgage on our lake house, they can handle it. If they come from a background of a city worker who's making $45,000 a year, 
and sees that kind of debt, they're going to get a negative message from their family. You just never pay that off. The fact is they can, but it scares away some of the right people who want to get into medicine. So we want to look at ways to reduce the cost of medical education and particularly reduce the debt to our students. And the finally is we need to develop a more diverse workforce. If our workforce is going to represent our state and the people in our state, they need to look from like the people in our state, they need to come from the same backgrounds as the people in the state, and live in the same areas of the people of our state. So we need programs that are going to focus on how do we develop people from rural backgrounds, from urban backgrounds, from less represented backgrounds in healthcare to get into our programs and be successful in our programs. So thank you, and I'll pass things along to Daniel. Thanks, Dr. Houston. And finally, we'll have uh, Daniel Yancey. I'm excited to welcome her to the panel. Uh, she's the director of the Native American Center for Health Professions at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. All right, Poso, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Danielle, and thank you for inviting us to share a little bit about the work that we do at the School of Medicine and Public Health with our center. Um, I think one of the advantages of going last today is that I think the rest of the panelists have really set some great context around the workforce development needs in healthcare, and then also with pathways programs, and particularly the need to connect with underrepresented students. And I think that's really where my presentation is going to focus on, you know, what has our center done towards um, reaching out to the tribal communities and native populations in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, so for my presentation today, I want to first start out with just a general overview of our School of Medicine and Public Health, um, kind of highlight some of the programs that we have within our school that uh, focuses on workforce development, and then also share some uh, best practices and some of our services and resources through our program. So first off, our mission at the School of Medicine and Public Health is advancing health without compromise through service, scholarship, science, and social responsibility. And our mission at the Native American Center for Health Professions really embodies that mission as an extension of that work. So our mission is to improve the recruitment and retention and graduation rates of Native American health professional students to promote health education research and community academic partnerships with Native American communities. Um, our center is relatively new, so we were established in 2012. We are supported in part by the School of Medicine and Public Health, but a few years after our center was started, we were fortunate enough to receive funding through the Indian Health Service through the Indians into Medicine grant. Um, so InMed uh, was really great in terms of bolstering our efforts towards healthcare. Uh, workforce development and recruiting more Native American students. So this $1 million five-year grant allows us to really do more work under our five mission aims, which is to recruit, retain, and graduate students, to also develop Native faculty, um, and to recruit more Native faculty. We also focus a lot on improving um, our students' experiences when they are coming to the university and leaving their homes. And we also have a lot of focus on enhancing the curriculum and education experience of our students to learning more about American Indian health and then also supporting our tribal community partnerships. So at the School of Medicine and Public Health we have an overall aim to optimize the health and well-being of Wisconsin communities. We also uh, try to live out the spirit of the Wisconsin idea. So what we are doing here at our flagship university taking that beyond the borders of our campus throughout the state of Wisconsin. So at the school we do have a number of statewide campuses at Green Bay, La Crosse, Marshfield, and Milwaukee. And the map here that you see um, highlights where those campuses are located in addition to our clinical sites. Um, what's really exciting about the work that's happening at the School of um, Medicine is that 75% of our incoming class are Wisconsin residents. So I think today we've been focusing on the healthcare workforce needs for our state. And so this is something we're really proud of at the school. Um, we also have an aim in terms of the design of our education and training is that we want our students to stay in Wisconsin. We heard a lot about the needs and how can we facilitate those opportunities as students transition from training to practice. <clears throat> a couple of programs that um, I wanted to highlight under this presentation that really focuses on um, underserved communities is our efforts to address health equity in the state. So one program is the Wisconsin Academy for Rural Medicine. Um, that are known as WARM. Um, so this program was started in 2007. They've graduated 126 students to date. And what I think is really profound about WARM is that of the 35 residency graduates to date, 91% of them are practicing in Wisconsin. So I think it reinforces a lot of what we've heard from the other panelists about making those intentional linkages. 
Um, our clinical rotation sites are at Marshfield Lacrosse and Green Bay. Our center works very closely with Warren because many of our tribal communities are located in rural parts of the state. So we have had some of our students that have gone the Warm track. Another program is the Training in Urban Medicine and Public Health, uh, better known as Triumph. Um, so this program recruits and prepares medical students to serve people living in urban HIPSAs. Um, what I think is really great about this program is um, with 52 students currently enrolled, approximately one-third of the Triumph alumni currently practice in Wisconsin. So again, making those linkages to meet the health care workforce needs of our state. Um, NATIP also partners very closely with Triumph. Um, one little known fact about the native population in Wisconsin is that uh, the, Milwaukee has the largest native population in the state. Um, so they do have health care services in the Milwaukee based area. So we work very closely with their program as well. So focusing a little bit more on NACHIP and the catalyst for our work, um, we heard a lot about HIPSAs and how those are identified. When you look at the map on the right, it shows you where the tribal communities are located within Wisconsin. There are 12 Native nations in the state and 95% of counties with tribal lands are HIPSAs. So this is a huge need within our tribal communities in the state. Um, <clears throat> and so I think was a major driving factor and presented a great opportunity of what we could do at our university to serve our tribal communities. Like many have mentioned, our programming really focuses on engaging with students early on, especially from our communities. A lot of our work focuses on relationship building. Um, because there's a shortage of health professionals in our communities, don't, don't have readily have access to mentors or see health professionals from their backgrounds. So we are very intentional with engaging students early on. This graph here shows kind of our cycle of programming that is engaging with students at the middle and high school level with programs like the People Program. We have an annual Indigenous Health and Wellness Day that brings 80 to 100 youth to campus um, in the spring each year. And then the work that we are doing with students um, in their first years of undergraduate programming all the way through to their application to health professional programs. So many of our students are first generation college attendees and the majority of them are also first generation for applying for health professional programs. So what our staff and and our support and services allows us to provide advising and mentoring and technical assistance and support for students through that process. One of the programs that we work very closely with in our school is RUSH, which is Rural and Urban Scholars in Community Health. This is a two-year program that, again, really has an intentional focus on rural and underserved um, urban areas of the state. And so the first summer experience is an eight-week research experience program, and then the second is a community health experience, which is also eight weeks. So I think all of this illustrates is the importance of connecting students to health opportunities throughout this long pathway. I think many people talked about how healthcare doesn't immediately yield professionals, right? This is kind of a building process and how do you keep students engaged and connected. We also offer a lot of support and resources for our students that attend our health professional schools. Um, we work very closely with our admissions office. We also do a lot in terms of cultural programming. So for our students, uh, research shows that students from tribal communities are 55 times more likely to return home to deliver care. So as they are participating in their training programs, we think it's vitally important to incorporate cultural programming as part of their training experience. So we do um, a community visits throughout the year that focuses on culturally congruent care, uh, traditional food ways and impacts on public health. So this is an important part of our programming. Our grant also allows us to offer our students additional professional development opportunities. So there is a national organization called the Association of American Indian Physicians, and they do an annual conference and offer um, a cross-cultural workshop that focuses on traditional medicine. So these are really important opportunities for our students as part of their training. Another really exciting part of the program that we offer is we work closely with um, tribal communities and healthcare centers in the state so that we can open up tribal clinical rotations, internships, and experience. So again, this is about creating those opportunities for students to train and learn within tribal communities, and I think supports the, um, the hope that they will return to these communities to deliver care after their programs are done. 
Um, we also have a partnership with North Dakota State University. Um, so they are the only Masters of Public Health program in the country that focuses only on American Indian health. So Dr. Donald Warren is the chair of that program. And so this, we are able to support our students to access distance learning opportunities to um, learn more about American Indian health. And then lastly, we have a Nature Advisory Council. So mentorship is also a really important aspect of supporting students through their academic pathways. And so we have over 20 um, Nature Advisory Council members who are faculty affiliates of SNPH who provide mentorship to our students as they are pursuing their programs. Um, some additional training and education opportunities that we provide is we, we give a lot of classroom presentations, we invite faculty for luncheons, we also um, started a distinguished lecture series this year. So this is all a part of our efforts to incorporate more American Indian health topics for all students that are going through the health professional programs. Like I mentioned here in the state of Wisconsin, we have 12 Native nations, so it's important that all future practitioners are learning about our communities. And like I mentioned, our partnerships with the clinics are also really important. So what have we been able to accomplish and, and how have we um, been able to move the needle in terms of increasing Native American health providers? This is a graphic that kind of shows um, our enrollment of American Indian students prior to the establishment of our center. In 2008 and 9, we only had one Native American student across all of our health professional programs. And as of 2017, we now have 23 students that are enrolled in our program. So we're really finding that with the complete package of what we can offer at our school is what is attracting our students to want to come and train and learn and eventually work in the state of Wisconsin, especially for those students who have an interest in American Indian health and practice. This is a breakdown by schools of you know, the number of students that we have in the various programs. We not only work with the School of Medicine and Public Health with our MD, PA, PT, Genetics Counseling, and uh, Masters of Public Health programs, but we also have a close partnership with the School of Nursing, especially with the recent award of the HRSA Stream Grant, which is really exciting. Um, they have uh, the goal of graduating 30 Native nurses over the next four years. We also work with the School of Vet Medicine, Social Work, and Pharmacy. So challenges and opportunities, and I think uh, we're seeing some trends amongst all of the panelists in terms of what the needs are. Um, the high cost of education is definitely a barrier, especially for families who um, are low income, are first generation, that is an incredible amount of debt to think about incurring over time. So loan forgiveness programs are really great. Increasing scholarships is another important mechanism. A lot of our students have accessed the Indian Health Service Scholarship Program, um, which I think is a really great opportunity because it not only helps students with their debt, but it also creates an intentional pathway for service in tribal communities following their graduation. Um, funding for educational programs like IDMED is also incredibly important. So that early engagement and connection starts very early on, but we're seeing that it has a profound impact on students going into these careers. Um, graduate medical education, there's definitely need for more opportunities there. Creating more residencies within the state of Wisconsin so we're not losing students is really important. And then increasing those clinical um, clinical capacity limitations is another barrier. So how can we open up more opportunities um, for that? So I just wanted to share some resources because I went very quickly through what our center does and there's always more to learn, but uh, we do have a Facebook page where we post opportunities, research and internship activities that are going on with our center. So that's a great way to follow us. This is also the link to our website. And We Are Healers is another really great digital mentoring tool um, that we use to engage with our youth. So I encourage you to check that out. And in your folders is a brochure um, that provides more information about our center. Well, thanks very much, Ms. Nancy, for that presentation and for your work. Um, I think we're pretty ambitious with the panel, so we're a little short on time. We might have time for one or two more questions if there's anybody in the audience uh, who has a question for the panel. Sure. I hesitate to step up since I already asked a question, but Dr. Zahner, you identified the choke points of uh, faculty as well as uh, um, where you can have the the graduates, um, I'm not sure what the term is, that where they can actually work after they've uh, completed their studies, like an internship. 
but you, and you call for additional um, funding. How would the additional funding be used to address that particular issue of faculty shortage and placements uh, shortage? Um, and with regard to the faculty shortage, the loan forgiveness um, issue is important in uh, preparation of nurses faculty as well. And so we've had that was Nurses for Wisconsin program helped with that in terms of providing loan forgiveness for faculty who, if they graduated, would stay in Wisconsin. And so that program is is kind of wrapping up. So continuing that kind of program would be very helpful in terms of the uh, faculty loan forgiveness uh, program. I think on the nurse residency side, um, you know, most of the nurse residency programs are run by organizations because they know it's a good retention and recruitment tool. Um, but most, or many, many, only 50%, a little over 50% of nurses work in hospitals. So a lot of the places where it's really hard to recruit nurses are, are not in hospitals so much, but in those other kinds of specialty areas, um, rural areas, public health, um, long-term care, those, those kinds of sites. And so um, the creation of residency programs, in fact, like an online residency, the state of Iowa does an online residency program for new nurses across the state. And so I'm not sure how that's funded, but funding to help support or help to get, get something like that started and supported over time um, might be a way to help that nurse residency piece. Great. I think we'll finish up by inviting Dr. Pittman. If you have any final takeaways after hearing what we're doing here in Wisconsin from where you're sitting in D.C., um, you know, one or, one or two thoughts to, to wrap things up would be great. Well, thanks. It's, it's been really fun listening to all of these very creative programs. Um, it's, it's really exciting. I think, you know, if we think about the content of the panel, obviously a lot of it was focused on education and another a um, whole chunk of it was focused on the uh, practice side. Um, I think th the work that you all are doing around um, pipelines to increase diversity, um, the really innovative and audacious effort to reduce medical school to three years with all of the implications that has is amazing. Locating the schools and the, um, the service locations in rural and underserved communities to try to encourage people to be exposed to practice in those areas is, is essential and I think really forward thinking and definitely something that um, that others should be emulating around the country. Um, and, and similarly, the matching um, of partners to be able to do GME um, in the in that in this um, sort of social mission orientation, I think is is really a wonderful example of leadership. Um, I think I heard less about career pathways and and I think because of my own work, um, it just seems to always be coming back to how important the entry level workers are in the healthcare system. And we do tend to focus mostly on the professions that are licensed, um, but this issue of career pathways that would lead to uh, licensed professionals um, uh, actually going through jobs like home health workers and community health workers and certified nurse assistants and so on, I think we tend to lose sight sometimes of the importance of those um, types of activities. We go from high school straight to medical school or to straight to nursing school. So I, I feel like that's an area where we could all um, be thinking creatively and be uh, getting more from our systems um, than we are currently. Um, on the practice side, you know, the, the themes that you all are talking about are th indeed the themes that I'm thinking about and researching as well. You know, obviously practicing at the top of education and license is essential in terms of efficiency of, of working with the incumbent workforce, uh, working in teams with the hope that they have adequate support and you can therefore sort of stretch a clinician further in terms of, you know, what they're able to do and their productivity. Um, the, the promise of new technologies, uh, telehealth and, um, of course, electronic health records. Everyone is hopeful that that will um, improve access and quality. And someone mentioned data, and as a researcher, I'd be remiss not to um, shout, uh, you know, hooray for that as well, because I think that for policymakers, it's really essential to have some accountability around these policies and have that feedback loop, and you can't do that without um, data. And I guess the, the last couple of thoughts just... Um, the things that I feel um, 
perhaps were not covered by the panel and, and in part they're not, you know, I, I didn't either, but I do recognize that as we think about sort of the broad swath of workforce policies, we, we do need to think about them more. And one is the, the issue of home health. And, and um, I guess we talked about the community health workers, but there's a huge shortage of home health workers and there's a real problem in terms of the quality of these jobs and the payment. And somehow as a country and as states, we have to figure out how to do a better job on that front because there's a crisis brewing and we all know it, but we, we tend in workforce policy to think about more about the, again, the, the more highly educated professionals, but we're gonna have to figure out how to do home health in a better way. Um, and the other um, thing that, that is sort of um, concerning me that I, I, I'm not sure how to address from a workforce policy area, but clearly we're not doing a very good job as a, as a country, is this usual source of care piece. Um, we're doing worse and worse, and somehow we have to be able to fill, figure out on the uh, delivery system side how to reconfigure the workforce so that we, we really do have a usual source of care because there's a lot of evidence that shows that, that improves health outcomes. So those are the two pieces that are possibly missing, but I, I really do um, want to say how much I've enjoyed participating on the panel and, and um, really learned a lot about what you all are doing in the state. And it's it's really an exam example, I think, to many other states, particularly on the education side, some terrific innovation going on. So thank you so much for, for allowing me to participate. Well, thanks very much. And thanks to all of our panelists. And I think with that, we'll, we'll bring today's briefing to a close. Uh, if you haven't done so, please make sure to fill out that evaluation, drop it on the table on your way out. Uh, all of the materials and uh, video, when it's available, we will be emailed out to everybody. So if you didn't register ahead of time, please do leave your email, a legible email address at the, on the sign-in sheet. Um, and sign up for our, uh, our uh, listserv, our next briefing, uh, save the date for March 21st. We'll be looking at the intersection of housing and health in our uh, ongoing series on social determinants uh, right back here on March 21st. Hopefully not on a day when the assembly is in session, but cross your fingers on that. Uh, so again, thanks to all of our panelists, uh, either virtual or in person, and thanks to everyone who was able to join us today.